Hello, everyone. Uh, I can only see some folks' faces, so feel free to drop questions, comments, concerns in the chat. Uh, I will say that, you know, so first I want to get a sense of the audience on a scale from one to 10, and don't overthink it. How often do you interact with data? Let's not define it yet. Data in your everyday personal and or professional lives. So 10 is like your entire living and being is consumed with thinking and working uh, with data. One is like, ah, I read the New York Times and there's a visualization every now and again. So, so 10 from Daniel. All right. There's no wrong answer, I should say. No wrong answer, eights, tens, nines. Okay, so a lot of folks, three, eight, seven, nice. So a lot of folks with a fair amount of uh, experience with data. Uh, feel free, These, you know, whenever I give these sorts of things, the, the audiences are quite varied. So don't hesitate to shout out if you're like, I'm bored out of my mind, or I have no idea what you're talking about, because I'm going to try to make it accessible to all everyone from one to 10. But let's see. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. All right, we're going to start weirdly emotional. Why not? All right, I want you to just think to yourself or drop in the chat a word or two. What's something you care about? A thing you think about? Something, maybe the question that keeps you up at night, but maybe something as simple as I care about lunch and my family and my whatever. Just drop it in the chat. The climate, mm, right there with you. Rule of law and justice, nice. Space, time, asteroids, you all have amazing interests. All right, cool. Let's see one more. Health and our food, fabulous. I care about all those things as well, right? All right. Now, you don't necessarily have to write this out, though you're free to. What I want to plant in your head as we go forward is what's one question about that thing that you just named, health, climate, uh, mental health, justice, et cetera, that you'd like to be able to answer with data. I don't mean that you have to be able to answer it with data right now or that data exists that could help you answer it, but what's, how can you turn that into a question that you can answer with data? Your cat, Jonathan, I want to hear that question. I take it back. Think to yourselves, except for Jonathan, write your question out, all right? All right, so, so be thinking about that as we go. Here's what we're going to do in our time together. I'm going to chat for a while, and then we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A and discussion and all that stuff. All right, so first we'll talk about who am I. Then we're going to talk about why we should be skeptical of data. Then we're going to talk about how to be skeptical about data. Then we're going to talk about your new favorite thing, if it's not already your favorite thing. Ooh, context. How much can we learn with minimal context? Love it. Beautiful question. All right. And then we'll sum up. So who am I? I am not the band, AJR. I was very upset when they stole my initials. All right. Not them. I am a professor and director of undergraduate studies at data science. Uh, as Russ said in the intro, I got my PhD at Michigan. I also taught at Carnegie Mellon for a few years between Michigan and NYU. I consult for companies. I help them basically create uh, better data and think critically about the data they have, specifically the data about their people. So if you've ever been in a company that's made you do a, an engagement survey or evaluate on a 360 how, how much of a leader someone is, I go in and I tell companies that they're doing it all wrong. That's what I do. And I also, uh, specifically at, data, at NYU, I teach a course called Data Science for Everyone. I teach advanced courses on natural language processing as well. But in particular, what I really care about is convincing folks who haven't come up programming or working with data or thinking quantitatively to see that they have value uh, in the world of data science and that we need their perspectives uh, as much as perspectives of those who've been speaking Python since they were born, right? Ah, American Journal of Rowan to Genealogy. I don't even know what that is but I like it. All right. As advertised, I also do comedy and circus in New York. And I used to try to pick a thing, academia, science, comedy, whatever. Uh, and I gave up on it. So I host a podcast called Majoring in Everything. If you, if you are someone who thinks you major in everything or know someone who does, basically, these are people who do lots of seemingly unrelated things and somehow make it all work. I would love to have you on my podcast. All right. Uh, and as Russ said, we'll talk about this more later, but I'm doing a, a show where I'm bringing together comedy and circus and data science into one big hour that nobody asked for on March 1st at Caveat. You can get tickets there. All right, end of the sales pitch. So why should we be skeptical about data? All right, why am I talking about this? Well, here's the answer that I would give if I were speaking to a company. I would say, well, there's a couple of reasons we should think about being skeptical of data. Number one, data science is exciting, but we could be doing more. Number two, our pressing problems require all hands on deck. Number three, we're all working in silos when really we need to collaborate. But my real motivation, and I feel like in this crowd, I can give you my real motivation, is that I am sick to death of when I say to people, I'm a data scientist, they say, ooh, what programming language should I learn? 
Then I say things like, actually, there's a lot more to it than programming languages. There's thinking and there's critical and there's this and there's that and this da, 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 da. And they say, right, right, right. But really, what programming language should I learn? And you all probably already know this, but asking what programming sh language should I learn when trying to think about how to do data science is like saying, hey, I want to build a house. What kind of hammer should I buy, right? Should I buy the Stanley Fatmax Smooth Mace Stanley hammer or this other hammer? And obviously the answer is the Fatmax, but that's not what we're here to talk about, all right? So my motivation is I want to get folks when they think about data and data science to say, how can I bring the skills and knowledge that I have to the field of data science, even if I'm not already in data science? And even if I am in data science, how do I do more imagination and creativity? And nothing against Coursera, a little bit, but nothing really, right? How can I pause to actually think about what data even is before I get all wound up spending all my time mindlessly pounding through some course on, on Coursera on Python, right? Yeah, nothing wrong with Python, but I think we're missing what really matters. Oh yeah. What are my goals in life? I'm so glad you asked, right? Getting lots of people and perspectives involved in data science, creativity and imagination in data science, as much as the technical side of things, and interdisciplinary cooperation. So the stuff that you all are doing is very up my alley. Now, tell me if this is too loud and I'll, I'm not sure if I can turn it down at this point. All right, buzzword time, right? Data science means a lot of things to a lot of different people. In some ways, it doesn't really matter for our purposes, but just to be crystal clear and so we don't overthink it, I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page that data science means better understanding what's going on in the world through Ah, data and say it with me, science, right? That's our definition. That's a really good definition of data science. Yes, programming is part of it and not to diminish the, the role that it plays. It is a crucial part of data science, but I want us to think about it as very much a tool to work with the data in a scientific way. All right, and to my undergrad students, I say, why would we do data science? Well, we wanna observe what's going on, what's going on in the climate. We wanna explain why is this changing? Why is that not changing? We wanna predict how <laughs> underwater are we gonna be in X number of years from now? All right, so that's what we're doing. You've probably seen this image before. If you are at maybe ranked yourself as anywhere five and above on your familiarity with data and data science, is that when we think about data science, it's very much at the intersection of these three areas, right? So programming, not surprising. Math and statistics, not surprising. But the area that I really think is important and we don't spend enough time thinking about is the substantive expertise. Actually knowing something about the field from which this data is coming. So being a climate expert, being a medical, you know, a trained uh, doctor, being someone who is a therapist and knows how to think about mental health. This isn't to say that others can't make sense of that data, but we need more folks with that kind of long-term expertise talking to those who are working with the data or being those who are working with the data. So regardless of your field, we need those folks in data science, right? So Uncle Sam time, everyone's expertise, uh, all hands on deck, we all have a role to play. A little bit of myth busting, right? I think uh, this, this should also not be controversial to you all, but just to make sure, a lot of people, when we say data science, we think data is the cold, hard, capital T truth. If you read the description for today's presentation, obviously the main point is that's not true. A lot of times when we think about science, and we're not gonna dwell on this second half of, of much, but I wanna kind of keep it in context with, with our conversations about data, is when people think data science, they kind of think the science word is only there to sound fancy because it doesn't sound like quite enough to say, I do data. So we say, well, I do data science. You're like, ah, okay, there's a little more to it than that. This is the sentence I wanna make sure that none of us ever say again. Maybe you're already not saying it, in which case you're my new best friend, but otherwise I wanna make sure that we are not saying data can speak for itself or anything like, what does the data say? That is the most evil question in all the world of data science, even more evil than what programming language should I learn? Not that that's a bad question. It's just not the useful one, right? All right, and we assume that if the science is there for a reason, then science must be right. Okay, so we all know where we're going with this. Fabulous, all right, none of these things are true. So data is not capital T truth. We're gonna spend most of our time together talking about why. The overview of my argument is twofold. One, data is a momentary approximation. We measured something at a particular time at a particular place, and it's a snapshot of that. These are what you know people are saying who they're going to vote for right now. These are my opinions about such and such as performance. This is what temperature it is here and now in this moment, right? So it's always out of date. That doesn't mean we throw it away, but it means we take into account the context and note that things change and think thoughtfully about how they're likely to change in the future, which already requires a fair amount of imagination. But what I really want to talk about is that data is a subjective approximation. 
something's going on with humans, right? That, and I'm not a cognitive scientist, but this is what I believe is going on. Something's going on where the minute we see something expressed as a number, we tend to think that that's true or right, right? And in some cases, it might be pretty darn close, but at the end of the day, it's we humans have decided to count something up in a certain way, to turn it into a number. And a lot of the stuff I just asked you all what you care about, justice, context, health, uh, climate, these are not things that are obviously numbers, right? And so humans get involved and say, aha, this particular idea, justice, climate, health, is worth measuring. This particular idea, whatever else, is not worth measuring. So it's the fact that we have data on something in the first place is itself a philosophical, ethical, and subjective outcome. And how we measure something is a subjective approximation. If I want to measure how, you know, the size of a human and whether I, I go by height, maybe I go by width, maybe I go by volume, maybe I go by whatever, right? That's me making a decision. It's not obvious that we're going to measure everything the same way. Important. This is not to say that there's no such thing as capital T truth. Sometimes when I give these talks, people say, ah, if, if, if data is subjective, then nothing is real and we can never learn anything about the world whatsoever. Truth is out there. We use instruments to turn those into numbers. As I said, we're not going to dwell on this point, but just to make sure we're on the same page, science is not itself inherently correct. One of the things that drive me nuts on the internet is when people say, da, 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 conclusion, because science, right? Ugh. Science is not an outcome. Science is a process. It's a process that we follow every single time by a community of folks who have agreed to follow those processes and be transparent about it. You all already know that, I'm sure. It's also always tentative and always iterative. Data is always tentative and always iterative, as is the entire process. We start with questions, which I hope that you're thinking about, and we're humble and hope that we are wrong because that's how we learn. Same thing with data. We hope that we can figure out why our data isn't a perfect uh, capture or perfect mirror of the thing that we're measuring. So we're always looking for that. So when we think science and popular culture, there's a lot of like, I'm on my Bunsen burners and I'm hacking and doing all those things or I'm hammering and that's it. That's all one tiny part of it. The vast majority is thinking a lot, right? And we all already know this as skeptics, but we're gonna zoom in on this evidence side of things. So you all already know as skeptics, we question things, we have ideas about what might be going on and then we check for evidence. The problem is, is that often in data science, really any empirical science, we assume that that evidence, once it's in front of us in a spreadsheet or a list or a whatever, right, that that evidence is true. Whereas even that requires some skepticism. So how do we do it? Ah, Daniel, any science with the word science in its name isn't a real science is one of my most hated sentences. As someone who somehow cannot shake fields with science, political science, computer science, data science, I agree with you. I do feel like it's trying a little too hard and I wouldn't mind if we could come up with a word. Like I wish, you know, economics isn't money science, but they got a word and I wish we had a word, but I'm with you, I agree. All right, so how, how? Well, the first thing we do to be skeptical about data is to erase all kinds of imagery like this from our brains. If you've done something that I do all the time, which is a lot of fun, but frustrating, Google image search the word data or big data or data lake or data, whatever, and you'll get a lot of images like this. I think even the image for uh, this talk, it's something that looks like that, which is awesome because that's what we think of when we think of data. We think of numbers swirling around that somehow have taken the mysterious, mysteries of the world out of the ether and put them into nines and zeros and ones and twos and whatever. And suddenly we know things and there's circles and stuff for no reason, right? All right, that's how I got the meetup image. Yes, Russ, yes. Instead, and this is not how all data sets look, right? But this is, pretty much the simplest version that's going to start to tell you something, right? Instead, every time we think about data, we should immediately think about <laughs> columns and rows. Yes, you can have multidimensional data that you can't even visualize in, a, in a, a graph like this one. But for now, think of this sort of thing as opposed to just numbers swimming around, you know, beautiful mind style. And we're going to come back to this data set in a second. What we're going to do when we look at, whoops, when we look at this particular data set is we're going to start to say, well, what might be wrong here? Why might each of these numbers be totally wrong? And if they are wrong, what do we do about it? Do we throw the data away? Do we delete that column? Do we, you know, multiply it all by some something to, to correct, quote unquote, right? What do we do? 
So here's where I'm going to get a teeny tiny bit luxury. So if you uh, don't have an undergraduate degree from NYU, congratulations, you're about to get one, right? I assume my students take other classes besides my own, but let's pretend that they don't. We're going to look for four common errors in a data set. All right. So random errors, what I'm going to call systematic errors, and maybe you've seen these underneath here, right? So selection bias, which is generally what I mean by systematic errors. You can, we can be complicated about what else is a, is a systematic error, but generally I mean something in the form of selection bias. And maybe if, you, if you've uh, done more reading or work in this, things like response bias, survivor bias, and other types of selection biases are familiar to you. Third is an error of validity. And finally, much less talked about is an error of exclusion. Just to have a sense of where we are here, uh, are these terms that you all already know or don't know? I see some shaking heads. Feel free to drop in the chat too. I can't quite see everybody. But if you're like, I know it all, they make sense. I'll take that. <laughs> Sanjay knows them, okay. All right, I assume. Okay, cool. Awesome, all right. I wanna make sure I'm using everyone's time well. So here we go. So random errors are in most data or maybe all data, depending on how complicated the data is, right? So random errors, we generally don't care about that much because they're noise. If they cancel out over time, sometimes I write something down and I'm a little too high and sometimes it's a little too low and they cancel out over time, on average, I'm probably right, so I don't care. The minute we have errors that are no longer random, we've got to do a little bit more work, right? The only time we really, I shouldn't say the only, but the main time that we really care about random errors is if we're really just missing a lot. And that's gonna play a role in our analyses more from like a sample size side. If we're truly randomly missing numbers, it kind of, it's not really gonna end us up in, in sort of biased territory. It's just gonna be, you know, not as, not as helpful or as accurate because we're just not working with as many values. All right, so random errors cancel out over time. You might heard of them talked about as being orthogonal, right, to the variables of interest. The variable uh, of interest, as it changes, the errors do not actually always go up when X goes up or always go down when X goes down. They often, not always, but they're often made when we're collecting the data, right? So I'm typing a number in and I'm doing it wrong. I used to work at 538 in one of my jobs. So a lot of their, their polling, I don't know if you follow 538, a lot of their polling is automated. We just have screen scrapers that say, this is what the Reuters poll for presidential approval was or whatever. But there's a ton, especially local congressional races and things like that, where the data is released in the form of this PDF that's impossible to read and slightly different every time. And it's insane to me that that's still happening. And so my job was literally sometimes to say, okay, this says 97, I'm writing 97, right? Sometimes I probably wrote 96 and sometimes I probably wrote 98. All numbers are wrong. Okay, right? But that doesn't mean we throw them away. All numbers could be wrong. A thermometer that's not exactly precise, right? A pedometer that accidentally picks up jostling as a step, right? I can toss my phone around and think that I'm like getting my steps in today. I mishear someone, I miss a text or whatever. Is our error random or not? Is the first thing we wanna think about. As I said, we assume when we go in that we're gonna have random errors and we're gonna assume until we have evidence to the contrary that they're canceling each other out. So what is evidence to the contrary? look like. This is the big one. And if you've done any kind of stats or econometrics or something, you've probably come across these, right? These are our systematic errors that are not random. They're not just, oh, the occasional jostle made it go up, but then the occasional time I took a smooth step made my, my counting go down, right? It's that I'm systematically wrong in a way that's going to overall affect my whole picture. My favorite example of this to keep going with the pedometer case is my, uh, a good friend of mine, I, I lived in China for a few years, good friend of mine in China, went to, shout out if you've ever uh, done this, went to Myanmar. I'm actually not sure if we're supposed to call it Myanmar or Burma now. So uh, that country. And he took a train from the south to the north. And the train is extremely bumpy. So let us know if you've done it, right? Extremely bumpy train. I haven't. Extremely bumpy train. So bumpy that the entire night his phone was going like this. And his phone thought he was walking the entire vertical distance across this country, right? And so that is a systematic error because he didn't then also walk in a smooth way for just as long back down, right? So that meant that for that particular day, his steps were just out of control, huge, right? And for the rest of his life, his Apple phone would be like, well, you walked a fair amount, but not nearly as much as that time, right? And his whole average for that year was off. Everything was off. This is a silly example. You can probably do a reset and get over that. But that's the kind of thing to be thinking about is that we've just, we're wrong and we're always wrong in some direction, high or low. All right, 
So and basically, as long as it's some kind of non-random pattern that we care about, uh, then we are worried about bias from this data. So they don't cancel out over time. One of the biggest things that I do as a data scientist is sit with companies and I sit in my own research and I say, okay, let's just think really hard about what kinds of biases might be afoot. There's no magic secret here, right? We're making a guess about what the world is like and we're looking at some numbers and we have to say, I have a reason to think, a principled reason to think that these numbers are systematically higher than the numbers that are in reality. I'm observing this set of numbers. This looks like the data. This is the data, but it's all off by some amount, right? Or some, some varied amount higher or lower. So we want to ask questions like, how and in what direction would this bias my results? Am I in general, in, in the case of my friend, I'm going to overstate how much walking I do in a given day, right? Or I might understate how much I did this year relative to the year before or something like that. All right. So selection bias is the biggest way that we'll see this. And I come from the social sciences, so I tend to think about data from humans, but we don't necessarily have to limit ourselves to that when it comes to selection bias. So this is when the values that show up in your data set in the first place are not random. Lots of times this is a sampling problem, but not always. So one big problem in a lot of social sciences, and I, I believe this was one of the reasons that, that psychology and other social sciences have had uh, problems with replication, is that you're not really interviewing a random sample or bringing a random sample in for your study, right? You're saying, I'm gonna do all my students in my class, or I'm gonna get all the people who are willing to do this for $10 or whatever, right? So it's not gonna be totally random. Another issue is volunteer-based studies. These are very common in medical studies, right? And we try to randomly uh, allocate folks, but generally speaking, you can't force someone, we're not gonna talk to ethics, right? But you can't force someone to be a part of most studies. So when we think, you know, random assignment and experiments, that's the idea is to counteract this selection bias, right? I've come forward and said, I want to be in this study. I've probably come forward because I'm super sick or I love taking risks or I need the money or whatever. And maybe those things have something to do with what I'm trying to understand. So I can say, yes, everyone who's come forward can join the study. But from there, I randomly assign into uh, placebo and treatment. So that's exactly what's going on is getting rid of that selection bias. Response bias is a big one, and we're not going to get crazy political here, but I will say that this is what I think is a very big issue in American and probably worldwide efforts to do public opinion polls, right? This is where we find our random sample. I will say that sampling is also a problem in American public opinion polls, but we'll leave it there, right? Sampling is, is, uh, is okay in this case, but participants are perhaps, they're aware of it, or perhaps they're not aware of it, not being honest, right? And there are a few reasons we might do this. One is social desirability bias. It's not necessarily uniform that, that, that voting is socially desirable, but generally speaking, we talk about it as a thing that we all should do, civic duty and rights and responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera, right? So generally speaking, if you say, I go to you and I say, you're going to vote in the next election, you're probably going to say yes, even though you might not, right? And that could be because you definitely aren't going to vote, but you don't feel like telling a stranger that you don't believe in voting and there's all these complicated things going on. So maybe you're going to lie to my face. I get it, right? Or you're going to say yes, because this is what I do. I, I have every intention of going to vote. But then on the day, this happens, that happens, there's a line, there's a whatever, and I don't go, right? So in this particular case, whenever I see data out there in the world about are you going to vote in the next election, you will, a good article about it, we'll have some sentences in there that say, we're probably overestimating how many people are actually gonna vote because of this uh, uh, social desirability bias. That said, that might not be true in every context and we just don't always know. Maybe it's the case in certain parts of the country or certain parts of the world that that social desirability doesn't really play a role or with certain demographics. So we're genuinely being speculative as we think about what these numbers are actually telling us. I think on average, they tend to be too high, but that's not a given. So right there, before we get into any kind of algorithms or predictions, we need to think, what, what is the likely truth given how these numbers are showing up? And what else I know about the population that I'm sampling? Another big one is how often do you exercise, right? This is something that, uh, or the flip, right? How often do you drink? I was, uh, went for my annual physical, not to brag, right? And they ask you these sorts of questions. And I was like, oh yeah, I drink, I exercise you know, four times a week and I drink never, you know, and that's not true. 
And that's not true either because I'm embarrassed to tell my doctor how much I really exercise or because I just don't know. And I tend to overassume how much I'm exercising and so on. So social desirability, maybe I have a bad memory, all kinds of reasons why I might not be telling you the truth. And the number that shows up in that data set, 4, 10, 60,000, right? 25% is the result of these biases and not just a perfect snapshot of the world. Finally, we have survivor bias. This is, I don't even know if this is political or not, but uh, this comes up a lot in the of evidence around vaccines, right? Someone shows up in a data set only because they didn't die. There's a lot of work out there on the effectiveness of having a vaccine uh, and how ill you get versus uh, natural and your immunity after that versus uh, versus getting sick and then your immunity after that. And it's like, oh wow, immunity after we don't get into it, right? But the thing is, is that if you die because you had COVID, you drop out of the study. So we have a huge piece of bias in that data, right? Because the people that aren't showing up are ones that we might be interested in, which is people who either got the vaccine and got sick and died or didn't get the vaccine and got sick and died. All those people are typically out of most data sets. We can do things to address it, but they're usually not there. Does anyone know this image? It's a, yeah, someone's nodding. Who is that? Eric, do you wanna, you wanna shout out what that means? You can unmute or type as you prefer. A map of where the bullets hit. All right. <laughs> nice. Yes, they had to reinforce the non-hit parts of the plane. Absolutely right. Thank you to those who know it. If you don't know it, this is an image of uh, planes coming back from uh, being attacked in war and where they were hit. Your instinct might be to say, OK, we got to reinforce the areas that were hit. But that's an example of uh, survivor bias, because what you really want to do are, are reinforce the areas that were hit because, or I'm sorry, that were not hit because those are the areas where planes went down and didn't come back. Yes, thank you, <laughs> Jimmy Carr, right. Uh, yep, okay. So what do we do about systematic errors? And you're welcome for this great graphic that no one asked for, right? So step one is anytime someone puts a data set in front of you, be on the lookout for it. What could be biasing these numbers up or down? Or in other cases, they might be biasing numbers out to the extremes or to the middle because you don't want to actually reveal, you know, one, one study was trying to understand, you know, the typical age of someone going to college. And if you say, how old are you? And you're in college and someone's maybe non-traditionally older or younger, they might lie and move towards the middle. So a bias isn't necessarily only positive or only negative. The best we can do, and this was one of the many reasons I was not cut out for journalism, because I think the most valuable thing we can do when we work with data before we start making our machine learning algorithms and all of that is literally sit and think, why would this be wrong? Well, this is hard to count because of this way. This is likely to be overstating this thing. We're likely to be missing this population, yada, yada, yada. And because I'm saying the word likely, I'm often getting out of the world of journalism, which I get. I'm not saying that they're wrong, but I'm saying it isn't for me because you can't, I would say, we're probably overestimating the number of people who are actually going to vote. And they'd say, we can't say things like probably in the news, right? which is a whole other story, right? But we need to be thinking, all right. We hope to minimize. If you have any control over the sampling methodology that you're using when you have a piece of data uh, or a data set that you're putting together, great. Otherwise, think about things like, I have this data set. It says, you know, 60% chance people are all gonna turn out to vote in the next election. I'm gonna guess that actually that number is 50. That's kind of the best you can do, right? Maybe it's 55. Maybe I have reason when I compare it to past elections and, and control for, you know, whatever other circumstances, I have reason to think it might be as low as 40 or whatever, right? And this is where that subject area expertise plays a huge role. And in my work as a data scientist, I just so often see those who are subject matter experts and those who do the numbers are afraid to talk to one another. And either those who do the numbers need to learn the whole area of, you know, how people respond to surveys or those who do the subject area expertise need to learn how to talk to those with numbers or ideally we have people who can do both. The main thing to do once you just have a data set is say, well, how is this likely to affect my results? So one big one that uh, I think many of us are probably thinking about these days, well, you tell me if you're thinking about it, is that uh, the measures for unemployment are very specific, right? And if you might be a discouraged worker and you haven't actually looked for a job, you drop out of this measure 
of unemployment or whatever, right? And so if we look at a number, we said, well, I'm not actually sure what the latest numbers are, right? The, the numbers are flat, the numbers are going up, the numbers are going down. That belies all kinds of data generating processes going on underneath that, which is are people dropping out? Are people getting jobs? Are people doing something else? And so having a sense of how something is measured, which is where we're going next, and having a sense of how that's likely, we're probably overstating uh, how many people have jobs right now or by understating, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Jan, pardon me if I say your name's wrong, survivor or success bias, cloud people's thinking on a great number of topics, business, success, money management, love, Ugh, yes, yes. <laughs> I didn't expect to talk about love today, but I'm here for it. All right. What else do we do? We adjust our inferences, right? So I'm on the lookout for uh, response bias. I think people are going to overstate how likely they are to vote. I'm going to think very carefully. Step two, try to minimize. Think very carefully about how I'm going to ask my questions to see if I can minimize survivor bias. And there's really interesting work going on in the areas of like questionnaires and polling and interviews and surveys that try to minimize the bias at that step. So one thing you can do, for example, is if you go out and say, hey, are you racist? Are you racist? People are probably going to say no. And we can talk about whether or not that's a response bias. If it is a response bias, it might be conscious or unconscious, right? Because generally racism is a bad thing. And generally, I like to think of myself as not racist, right? It turns out that instead of saying, hey, are you racist? Say, do you know anyone who's racist? Gets you a much more accurate answer, right? So that's in the data collection stage. You can see the same thing. Are you planning on vote? Do you, how many people do you know who are going to vote? In, in the whole Trump prediction business, right? Are you going to vote for Trump, especially in 2016? Are you going to vote for Trump? Do you know anyone who's going to vote for Trump? What percentage of your friends are going to vote for Trump? There's studies that show that that kind of questioning actually gets you much closer to what truly happened, right? All right, so then we consider how it's going to affect our results, and then we adjust our inferences, right? I'm not just going to say, ah, you know, like, uh, uh, unemployment has stayed flat. Everything's fine. I'm going to say there might be something else going on, so I'm not going to make these conclusions, right? One of the other things that I do with companies, I mentioned engagement surveys. Shout out if you've done engagement surveys. Uh, uh, in the chat, I typically find them to be terrible, right? One of the things that happens with engagement surveys is companies get very fixated on the overall average engagement at a company. They say in the last quarter, our engagement was 80%. This quarter, it's 85%. So it's gone up. So our employees are happier. Maybe, and I guess technically, if you believe all those measures, which again, yes, to engagement surveys, not sure the data too. Yeah, they're all terrible. All right. They're not all terrible. Well, the ones I've seen are not great, right? And part of the reason is because we're thinking about it the wrong way. If engagement went up from 80 to 85, it could be because everyone in your workforce got a little bit more engaged at work. Again, assuming we're actually capturing engagement. Or it could be that the people who were miserable left, right? And so that's going to make engagement go up. So often when I work with companies who are obsessed with getting their engagement numbers up, they don't really worry about the data generating process for how it goes up. They just care that it's gone up and you're making entirely incorrect conclusions about what's going on in the area you care about. All right, so measuring income is another one, right? So if I wanted to actually understand how much money people make, there are lots of ways to do it. There's a lot of data out there from employers, but suppose I walk around New York City and I have a somehow randomizing strategy and I say, hey, how much money do you make in a year? Do we think that wealthier people are more likely to stop and talk to me and answer? Yes or no? Or under what conditions? No. No, less likely if wealthy. I'd love to hear why if, you, if you're able to share. I realize it's a lot of typing, especially for a Saturday. Guilt. <laughs> yeah. Too busy, don't want to disclose, right? So it could be the case that if I'm in, in New York City and I'm walking around and I say, hey, I want to ask you what your income is, someone who actually makes more than the median or more than whatever is in whatever percentile, right, is going to say no, either because they're sort of self-conscious and talking about money is, is weird in the United States and it's a bit fraught and, and it, it might seem like bragging and so you might understate it, right? Or you're less likely to even stop. Either you're, I don't know, you're, you're, you might be busier, though that's probably not quite right, right? But generally speaking, okay, we're maybe missing the most uh, wealthy people. Also, the most wealthy people are probably being driven around or in a helicopter. I've seen succession, right? All right. Yes, thank you, Harry. How likely are they even to be walking in the same sidewalk? So I, I have some strategy to randomly pick people on the sidewalk, but the people on the sidewalk are not the wealthy people, right? Very good. So already right there, it's, it's a very basic thing, but it it's actually requires a lot of thinking, right? Okay. Do we think that, and let's start, keep with New York City, right? 
would participants at any income level likely overstate their income? Are there, what's an income group that's likely to overstate how much they make? And frankly, I said New York City, but let's, I would love to hear from Toronto and Tel Aviv and others as well, if you think, because uh, there's probably, probably different things going on there. So who's most likely to overstate? <laughs> Craig, yes, crooked ex-presidents. Yes, right? You have some, some public facing reason to sound like you have a lot more money than you do. Could be, right? Maybe a reality TV star, whatever, right? Uh, if you're self-employed, right? Either you have to kind of tell yourself because you're too nervous or you don't quite know. Yeah, so probably if you're, may, I don't know exactly, right? But somewhere in the, on the lower side of things and, and maybe are self-conscious or maybe don't quite even really know or haven't really taken the time to work out the taxes or whatever, or you have a reason to, <laughs> to, to lie for reputational reasons. Yeah, you want to end up on that Forbes list, and so you, uh, you do it. And if you're a self-help guru, for exactly, right? So on average, we hope that, that maybe it's a random error. Maybe I'm just, oh, it's, it's, every now and again, I'm going to get a self-help guru or an ex-president, but every now and again, I'm going to get someone who, who understates it, and so we hope it cancels out. We don't know, right? And the reason I asked about Tel Aviv and Toronto, if you're open to sharing it, maybe you don't know, is that there are different cultures around money in different places. When I lived in China, it was a very normal, common, not taboo question to ask someone how much money they make. I would get asked all the time how much money I made, right? And I couldn't answer because I'm bad at numbers in Chinese, right? Uh, but uh, it wouldn't be weird. And so I would imagine that if I did a public income survey in downtown Shanghai versus downtown New York City, I would get more accurate numbers in Shanghai through everything else being exactly the same for cultural reasons only. All right. Uh, in this case, we're, if we're calling someone or maybe we're, we're on the street, but they're not actually walking the street, they're like in a corner or they're in a homeless shelter or whatever, we might be missing the very, very poor uh, as well, right? Who also probably wouldn't want to share in that first place. By the way, this <laughs> number here is just to say that this painting was two hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars. Two hundred sixty-two nine hundred. All right. Response bias: a way to remember this is that everybody lies. Just assume when you ask people questions, they are not telling you what they actually do and what they actually think. They are telling you what they think they do, what they think they think, or what they think you want them to think or do, right? So, so surveys are really tricky. And again, I'm in social science. I spend a lot of time with survey data. Doesn't mean we throw it away. It means we think very carefully about what, what this is actually picking up, right? What cultural biases, what social preferences, what uh, so on. Finally, and we're gonna talk about this a lot more in a moment, errors of validity. This is when we are not measuring what we think we're measuring. We think we're measuring one thing, we've got this data and we're using it to tell a story about climate or, or uh, vaccines or whatever, or uh, elections, but it, we're actually not even picking that up in the first place. One way to start to think about errors of validity is to ask yourself when you're looking at a column of numbers, say, what am I ruling in and ruling out with this measure? So a big one that I spent a lot of time thinking about in my PhD was democracy. There's all these measures out there in the world about how democratic the world is, right? Is this country a democracy on a scale of one to 10, how democratic, on a scale of one to five, on a scale of minus 20 to 20, how democratic? Flag number one is that even the measures of democracy have their own bias built into them because most of them come from people, historically have come from people who are uh, based in democracy. So American, European scholars, who assume democracy is good. And so you tend to measure it in terms of democratic to non-democratic with higher numbers being democratic and already baked in there is some pretty normative ideas about regimes. It was only in the last decade, maybe a little bit more that we started to say something more thoughtful than non-democracy. We started saying things like autocracy, things like that. Good book on the subject, Everybody Lies. I have that book right over there. Yes, great. Controversial answers, spouses, <laughs> yes. Daniel's coming in hot with the jokes, I like it, all right. So when we think of democracy, we tend to think, ah, it's a country with elections, right? Then you immediately wanna ask yourself, am I ruling in any non-democracies that hold elections? There are a lot of countries out there that hold elections, but based on this simple definition alone, we'd pick up, right? This is going on YouTube, so I'm not gonna list them here. Am I ruling out countries that I think are democracies, but don't meet the criteria? We'll see some examples in this case. Am I picking up something else entirely, right? Working with companies, one of the things that they're all obsessed with is finding the top talent. Everyone wants to hire the top talent. And then I said, well, what do you mean by top talent? 
And either they have no answer or they say something like leader or they say, uh, went to a top school and got a degree that I find impressive, right? All right, so good grades, high ranking schools, maybe, but does this actually reflect talent, right? And you can think about the same thing in the courts article I talked about the SATs. The SATs measure something, right? And they're not, I'm not saying they're noise and that we necessarily need to throw them away. I felt like they were a pain at the time, but they're not necessarily picking up how well I'm gonna do in school or my overall levels of talent or intelligence. So validity is when we've got all these numbers and we're using them to explain something, but actually those numbers don't represent that thing. All right, last one, errors of exclusion. We can argue that this is a systematic error and if you want to, I'm fine with it, but I think it's worth its own category because it's even deeper. You might've heard this as invisibility bias. This is when we're missing variables or members of a population because we don't think we're interested in them, because we don't think it's important, or we don't have any metrics to measure that thing in the first place. They're really hard to think about. Usually this is related. A lot of times, so I wanna use the example from the beginning, which I'm so glad, I, I, Judy, was it you? I don't, someone, I forget. Whoever said justice, right? Justice is an amazing thing that I would love to measure with data. There's efforts out there, right, to measure justice. You're probably not gonna find a very good data set that's just about justice, one to 10, right? But there's indicators of justice that you could, you could start to tease out, right? But why isn't there a measure of justice, right? We're, we're measuring democracy. Democracy is an idea, it's abstract, right? Let's get out there and do some more measuring of justice. Well, maybe we haven't thought it was important, or maybe we think it's not interesting. Maybe your answer is, well, we just don't have any measures of justice, so why would I hang my hat on a career where I'm measuring justice? Well, we probably don't have those measures because we're not interested. Yeah, I don't know how to measure justice either. Great. And if you think of all kinds of things that we're arguing about, God, I'm getting more political than I want to, things like uh, uh, privilege and racism and, and sexism and all that stuff, they're really hard to measure. And one reason might be the people who <laughs> need to do the measuring are not thinking that it's important, right? NYC bike deliveristas are an excluded class. Craig, tell me more. I think I know where you're going with this, but tell me more. So it's socially excluded groups that often don't end up in data sets. So we're thinking Dalit, Romani, incarcerated populations are often left out. Does that matter in every study? No, but if we're trying to make claims about what's going on in all of this country or all of this city and we're missing these groups, then we're not actually telling a story. I'm, I think, Craig, where you're going is, is the gig economy and working, but I, maybe there's something specific with bike uh, that I'm missing. Ah, uh, interesting. They've been left out in micro uh, mobility studies. Yes, yes. Uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 90s is a really depressing and good example, strong example of this, right? It just wasn't studied because we didn't think it was important. Or the people, the we, quote, who were doing the deciding of where funds are going to go and what we're going to actually invest money in understanding, decided or thought or even tacitly left HIV AIDS off the table. Uh-huh, yeah, oh, interesting, Craig, until the pandemic, okay, right? And so that led to serious outcomes and because we just weren't picking up those numbers. Informal laborers, right? I don't know, Craig, this also is, is, is related to what you're saying, but if we talk about what's the overall GDP, what's productivity, what's this, what's that? And we're leaving out informal labor, whether it's uh, uh, domestic work or whether it's uh, something where you're kind of getting paid under the table or whatever, we're, we might be leaving a lot out. And in some economies, that really matters. There are a lot of countries where if you leave that out, the numbers you're actually getting are not reflective of anything meaningful. Again, to use my example from my consulting is this comes up, uh, ooh, Daniel, I will. Please explain the phrase picking up. Yes, so what I mean by that is if I'm gonna go out and say, uh, uh, here's, you know, here, here's my study of, of how happy New Yorkers are, right? Uh, if I'm not measuring very carefully or if I'm not thinking about my sampling strategy in a thoughtful way, I'm not necessarily picking up how New Yorkers are, which is to say collecting into my, through my net into becoming data in my spreadsheet. I'm not picking up homeless people, gig workers, incarcerated populations, folks who live in, you know, uh, uh, unofficial housing or something like that, right? So by picking up, I mean, I mean adding to my data set in this particular case. Thank you for that. All right, so another thing that, that is often left out, um, uh, skills in the workplace, right? A lot of the time with companies, we wanna measure talent, leadership, as I said, but we don't actually go out and, 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 and think about uh, how we're picking up those particular things. And so talent might be coming up as uh, uh, outspokenness as opposed to uh, actual contributions and things like that. And I might be leaving out someone who just doesn't speak up in a meeting 
because I'm only measuring the contributions from those who spoke up, right? A lot of people try to do things where we understand, you know, privilege and, and all of that in the workplace. Uh, a lot of things that we don't ask about are disability, chronic illness, religion, and so on. Sometimes those are left out for legal reasons. That makes sense. Uh, but we have, uh, you know, we're not picking up those, those folks either. Picking up. I say that a lot. Thank you. What do we do? All right. Step one is we're going to think really hard about it. Then I'm going to get to measurement, right? So we're going to be on the lookout. We're going to think every time someone puts a data set in front of you, you should, if you're reading the New York Times, or you're reading whatever, and someone puts a data set in front of you in a visualization, click immediately on the source and go to the source and read where that data came from and how it was measured. I'm not saying it's all wrong. I'm saying it's probably different from the way it's being presented in the news, right? Hold it up under these four lenses that we just talked about. How is this likely to affect the results? The answer might be, I don't have a good reason to think it's affecting my results. Cool, but we gotta go through that process. Update your conclusions and inferences accordingly. Hopefully, you know, as data journalism and all of that becomes more of a thing, I, I mean, I'm not saying that, that media is dishonest, but I'm saying that we're not necessarily as nuanced as we should be when we talk about what's in data because no one wants to go through and talk sampling strategies when you're scanning headlines, right? But I think we all should. All right. If the errors are so great that you're just like, I don't think I can trust this, then you might need to find new data. A big example is uh, in the case of corruption. There's a lot of data out there about how corrupt is a country. And if you look at these global data sets, there are a lot of countries that don't have an answer for that. And those missing countries, in my mind, are ones that are probably the most corrupt. Right? So we're missing a big piece of the picture that we might really, really need in order to tell the story or ask the question that we're trying to. At minimum, be hyper skeptical if anyone comes to you and says, the data says this, or say whatever, right? The data says this, the data speaks for itself. Uh, according to the data, it all went up or it all went down, right? If someone isn't saying, well, there's probably this uh, selection bias and there might be this response bias and my sampling wasn't 100% random, the more caveat someone gives you, I think the more you should trust that data or, or the more you should uh, embrace their conclusions. Ooh, po podcast on measuring justice, thank you. Right, it's not enough to identify errors. One of the most common uh, pitfalls when you first start learning about how to be skeptical of data is to say, well, you probably oversampled this and undersampled this and you're probably missing these people and you're probably missing those people and you're, you're measuring this all wrong. You have to then do the work to say, well, how would this affect the results? The results are, actually the labor force isn't trending the way that you say it is. Actually, the outcome of the election is gonna be different, right? If you don't do that step two, you're kind of just naming problems and it's not helpful. Just to, to be sad for a moment, inspecting and organizing data as a data scientist and those who are who numbered, you know, 789, you, you probably know this all too well, data preparation, what I'm counting as the cleaning, the processing, the making sense of, the getting it in an order that you can work with, and then reading the documentation about, well, why is this a seven? How did this 25 get here? Who did they ask these questions to? What, what oil rigs were they tapping into when they calculated the measure of oil production in Alabama? Whatever, right? All of that, according to this particular uh, Forbes study, which is, we can talk about that some more in a, in a moment, uh, is, uh, is a big part of data science. When we think data science, we think hackers and we think typing, and my students definitely think it's just programming, right? But most of it is just sitting and staring at your data and being like, what's going on in here? What is this? Do I trust this? Does this make sense? Is this fair? Am I missing big country? What's, you know, how is it measured? By the way, this is, I don't, I'm happy to share the, the, the deck if that's helpful. I don't have to, but there is an article uh, to back up this study and it turns out on their methodology. So this looks pretty official, right? It turns out they asked like 25 data scientists. This is a terrible study, right? But you don't know because I haven't given you any information on this. So even Forbes talking about data preparation did a terrible job of saying that like, this is probably some serious selection bias small sample size. There's a hole in the pie chart. Pie charts are the worst, right? Just full stop and do a whole different hour on that. All right, we're almost done here. Also, this is the part that makes me sad. Same study, again, who are these people? Uh, said that the least enjoyable part of data, uh, of data science is cleaning and organizing data. I disagree. I think it's great fun. And we're gonna be thinking more about that. There's even more to read about it. Someone called it data munging, the painful process of cleaning, parsing and proofing one's data. We spend so much time thinking about algorithmic bias and, and all that, and we should, and it's important, but the stage where we make decisions about what's even in the data set in the first place and how we're going to categorize things is so important. Donut chart, I see. All right, I'm going to wrap up soon. I've lost all track of how long I've been talking. I could talk about this for a very long time, but we're just going to wrap up here, which is to say we're not all powerless. Yes, most of the time we're given a data set and we just have to think really hard about what's in it and do our best. 
and then thoughtfully communicate what's in the data when we talk about our results and our predictions and our explanations. But if we are so lucky as to go out and create our own data sets, what I urge you all to spend a lot of your time thinking about, this is, here's an era of exclusion, this wasn't even in those donut pie charts, right? Is the art and science of turning the world into data in the first place. So the truth is out there. Yes, there's a reality out there. I mean, we're all living in a simulation, but apart from that, there's a reality out there, right? At some point we get that reality into numbers and we do it through this beautiful act of measurement, which is my favorite act in the whole wide world, right? All right, I'm gonna leave it there. So only some truth ends up as data. What's in that sum? We've seen response bias, selection bias, survivor bias, exclusion bias, all of that already. But what we need to think about is how are we as humans turning the world into those numbers? Should I study something? How do I study it? This is gonna be based on my biases about what's important, what's worth investing in. I gave the example of HIV AIDS. Another big one in political science is uh, after 9-11, if you wanted to get funding from the National Science Foundation and political science, you had to talk about how your research was connected to terrorism and counterterrorism. It didn't matter what it was that you, I study the Supreme Court, but the influence on terrorism, and then you're gonna get money, right? I'm not saying it's all corrupt. I'm saying we've got to think about what we're prioritizing and that it doesn't just come from on high as a subjective thing. And know that there's a possibility of errors. So here are your words for the next cocktail party we all go to, which I guess will be in 2036, all right? So word number one, conceptualization. These are my two favorite words in the whole wide world, conceptualization and operationalization. If I'm measuring something, I'm going to conceptualize it and then I'm going to operationalize it. All right. So what do you mean by the thing you are interested in? This is not going to be easy, but if you want to take a stab, I would love to see what do you mean? This doesn't have to be a dictionary definition. This doesn't have to be the best definition in the whole wide world. When you said climate, health, mental health, justice, your cat, Whatever it is that you said, what do you mean by that thing? I said democracy earlier and I offered elections. That's certainly not particularly satisfactory. There's a lot more to it, but suppose I just left it there, right? So I'd love to hear how you conceptualize that thing that you were thinking about. The underlying human interested thing you're trying to measure. Yes, so what is, what is that thing, right? One of the things that I love reading are those studies about, uh, and I'll see, we'll see an example in a moment, about happiness, right? What's the happiest country? What's the happiest generation? What's, what age group is happier? Are men happier? Are women happier? Da, da, da. There's all these questions. And it's like, oh my goodness, how are we measuring happiness? And it turns out if you measure happiness in different ways, you get very, very different results. Judy, people being treated equally in context of their circumstances, their information. Fantastic, fantastic conceptualization of justice. I love it. Of course, there are a million other ways that you could do it, but let's start there and just narrow the scope from this big idea to something we can start building from. Perfect. All right. So what aspect of this big broad thing are you going to measure? You're going to measure people being treated equally with, with thoughtfulness around regardless of context, circumstance, et cetera. Okay. Step two, this is the, the old one too, right? It's easy, but very hard. How are you actually going to turn that thing into data? In this case, I'm gonna say numbers, data, of course, can be words, it can be all kinds of stuff, right? How are you gonna turn, so Judy, I'm gonna keep putting you on the spot. How are you gonna turn people being treated equally into numbers? There are a lot of efforts out there to do this. All of them are imperfect, that's okay, right? What would you do? I'm so curious to know. And again, others uh, as well. Measure circumstances, then measure equality of treatment, right? So even from there, we'd have to go on. I mean, this is a multi-year study that Judy has just proposed, which is awesome, right? Measure circumstances. Are we doing uh, income, housing, uh, uh, social interactions and how positive or negative or stressful or anxiety or whatever, health, uh, lifespan, all kinds of different things, right? Of someone's circumstances and then measure the treatment. You know, how many minutes does the doctor spend with you? How many times are you called on in a meeting, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's lots of people out there doing those different things, but every data set we get is a different person who's zoomed in in a slightly different way. So Judy's data set is gonna be slightly different from everybody else's data set, which is a good thing. All right, so how are you specifically gonna count and record? Are you gonna get data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics? Are you gonna go out and ask people in Manhattan and so on? The operationalization side of thing is the practical. So philosophical and then practical. I gave you the example of democracy before, right? What predicts whether a country is gonna be democratic? Political scientists are obsessed with saying is, is are we gonna see more democracy or less in the world? 
Or we might say, what's the effect of being a democracy on income or health or lifespan or whatever? There's a lot of work out there as well. Is the world overall becoming more democratic or less, right? There's a lot of talk of this kind of stuff in the news. And we think about the crisis in American democracy. I put in quotes just because it's a thing that people say in the news, not because I have a view on, well, I'll see, set that aside, right? So we need to know how democratic is a country. So to use our example a little bit more deeply, right? I could say elections, maybe by democracy, I just mean elections, okay? Maybe I mean something more specific. I mean, free and fair elections. Woo, okay, what does that mean, right? Maybe I don't mean anything to, to do with elections. Maybe I mean freedom of speech. Maybe I mean freedom of assembly. Maybe I mean an independent press, right? I probably mean a whole bunch of those things all in one, but every measure is gonna prioritize a different set of them. And so what numbers you get from the economic uh, intelligence unit versus the polity score versus the whatever is going to be slightly different. Again, a good thing. So I might choose free and fair elections. That's how I've conceptualized democracy. Judy has said people treated equally in context, uh, uh, given their circumstances. That's how she's conceptualized justice. So maybe if I conceptualize democracy as regular, free, competitive, and fair elections, it's probably pretty decent, right? To operationalize, how am I going to turn all those things into numbers. What are the rules for counting up these concepts? So one rule that's out there is, and this is put, putting it not as specifically as they do, is a country has to have three elections in a row, like, like every two years, evenly spaced, right? You have to have more than one. One election won't make you a democracy in this particular measurement that I'm offering up, right? You gotta have at least three, okay? They have to be free. Some percent of the population is allowed to vote, or actually votes. I could debate that. There's a lot of places where it's like everyone can vote, but then when you actually show up, very few people get to vote, right? Or can everyone vote? There has to be more than one party running and have a chance at winning. That's hard to measure, but let's go with it, right? And it has to be fair. This is my favorite one, right? Whoever wins actually has to take office and there's transparency around how the votes are counted. This obviously, this data point has been the source of a lot of conversations in the United States. It's just this last piece right here. And all of this boils down to measurement and how we've decided to measure these things. The key is that no measure is perfect. All data is wrong because we've measured it in a way that we've decided is worth measuring and we've decided how to do it and how to conceptualize and how to operationalize. But that's okay. The thing that we do is then try to understand multiple measures of something at once. So the really robust studies and the studies that make me feel good about the world are the ones that say, hey, I evaluated, for example, the relationship between democracy and economic outcomes or democracy and health outcomes or democracy and education. And I'm so biased in zooming in on these things, right? And I did it according to the top five or top 10 most common data sets in the world. There's going to be a lot of overlap. Uh, we're not going to get into the weeds on this, but you know, it, it, what we call a democracy in many cases is going to be what we call a democracy in other countries. But every single one of these data sets has different thresholds for democracies and different democracies that they are ruling in and ruling out. So the best studies, when you can do it, triangulate from lots and lots and lots of different data sets. If I'm studying justice, I'm gonna use Judy's measure and I'm gonna use this other measure and this other measure and my own. And then I'm gonna maybe have a fighting chance at more of a picture. To give you an example of the kinds of things I wish we all just read as a matter of practice are things like this, a statistical appendix, right? This is from the, uh, the World Happiness Report. I gave you the example of what's the happiest country in the world. One attempt at this is from a project called the World Happiness Report. I think it's like worldhappiness.org. You can look it up. They've done it every year for the past 10 or 15 years. And they say this is the happiest country. It's not surprisingly, it's always Denmark or Finland or whatever, right? And we can do things where we say, wow, the US has become less happy over time and, and yet that, and it's interesting. And I don't think that their data is, needs to be thrown away. But I think if we're going to make some conclusions about, wow, we should all emulate Finland, we should work with more than just this one data set. And as you can see, if you zoom in, they have this here, it's hard to get to, you can read how they've defined happiness. In this particular case, you're going to see, you know, stories in the news, say Finland's the happiest again, Denmark's so happy, right? You say, okay, well, what do we mean by happiness? In this particular case, it's from a Gallup World poll that says, yo, imagine a letter, right? With steps are numbered from zero to 10. 10 is the best life for you and zero is the worst life for you. What's your number? And then they take the average of that for each country. Already we're losing a lot of information because wouldn't it be interesting to have a sense of the variance, right? Or the distribution of those answers. And maybe, maybe the US is very bimodal. People are super happy and super not. I don't know, right? But just this question, is that 100% airtight on what happiness is? Of course not, right? Is it totally garbage? Well, no, 
But let's go through and ask about happiness in a lot of other ways. How often are people laughing when you see, look at the streets, right? How many positive comments are coming from Twitter from that country? How many, uh, uh, one minus, how many people are, you know, being treated for mental health? But even that's not great because you could be seeking mental health support and that could be making you happier. So it's very, very difficult to do. All right. All right. So why you all know this, you're skeptics, right? This is probably very, very basic. I'm going to keep complaining about companies and then I'll wrap up, right? Companies are like, I get it. Yes, there's truth out there and I'm turning it into data and I'm doing it through measurement. That's no problem. And I'm doing it for three steps. Validation we haven't talked about mainly for time, but basically it means, did you do it? <laughs> Was it right? Go back and gut check. Sometimes that just involves saying, does this country seem like a democracy? Ask the experts. And if not, then maybe we need to revise our measure. It's that philosophical and, and potentially subjective as well. So companies say, yeah, 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 no problem. I got it, right? And then they say, okay, but when we study leadership, we're going to do uh, the following. We're just going to rate everyone. We're not going to define it. And then we're going to hope for the best. This is what every company I've ever seen does when they actually try to measure something as important as who their top talent are, right? What they should be doing, and this is not a perfect measure, but start to be a little bit more thoughtful. How would I operationalize what I specifically mean by leaders? How would I measure something like a team member's growth? And then go back and look and say, who have I listed as top leaders and who haven't I? And go on to that. I never see companies do this, even though it kind of makes sense philosophically, right? And so I'm not saying that because companies don't do it, we don't all do it. But that's a big area that I spend a lot of time thinking about where we, if we were just a little bit more careful, I bet we'd get much better data. Instead, here's some more airing of grievances. These same companies invest in massively complicated and massively expensive, say, machine learning algorithms to try to predict people's performances or, or try to anticipate who's going to leave the company and then counter offer or whatever. And that's fine, but spend some time making sure that your data is any good in the first place. All right. So last piece here. I want to hear what you guys have to say. So we're going to try two things. First, I want to hear you conceptualize and operationalize protests. This is a big one. So let's start with conceptualize. Feel free to unmute at this stage or, or drop it in the chat. What, how would you conceptualize protests? I want to understand, are there more protests in New York City? Are there fewer? Are protests effective? In order to do any of those things, I need to understand how to measure a protest. What do we got? Ah, numbers of people. Good, Eric. So some group of people in public, maybe it needs to be 10, 20. 50. We could argue about that, right? Ah, issue being surfaced. It's only a protest if the issue has something to do with, with say, I don't know, so sociological, socioeconomic, something political, as opposed to, I don't know, I mean, a boycott of a product. Is that a, is that a protest? Probably not. So, okay. So, so products somehow are out, right? It gets tricky, right? Level of media coverage. Yes, Craig. Yes. One of the trickiest things to measure in the whole wide world is whether an event happened because it usually all kinds of stuff happened, but only some of them are covered. And so we're missing all kinds of protests that the media doesn't think is interesting. All right. How clear is the issue? What side are they on? Great. Okay. Sticking each of you with your conceptualization, how much you even begin to operationalize. Number of people we can operationalize. One, two, ten, right? Okay, what else? Scott Page's standing ovation model. Daniel, yes, he was my dissertation advisor, and I love that model. All right, everyone look that up. Factor out just regular gatherings, factor out riots. Right, Eric. So we'd have to say it's a certain number of people. Okay, step part A of operationalizing. Part B is, you know, what are they, are they here to maybe change some status quo in some way. Maybe we could say something like that, right? So they're a gathering that's like singing Christmas carols. No thanks, right? A riot. Ooh, how do we define that? But maybe a certain level of violence. We've, we've, we've escalated past protests. So that's out. So a number of, I don't know, broken something, injuries. Hard to say, right? But you can kind of start to go there, right? Language on signs, chants that are heard. Fabulous. We're not going to do it today, but what you would then do if you wanted to go out and do this study is say, okay, or read, because there's tons of measures of protests out there. There's some really cool graphics out there that show where protests are happening all the time, but Captain <laughs> Skeptic of Data, go in and look and see what's counting as a protest, even in those cool visualizations. We then want to think about what's a strength and a weakness, and we want to think of lots of these, of our measure. Well, we're going to miss really, really small protests that might actually really matter. 
uh, by narrowing it to changing the status quo, we're going to miss protests that are about a broader set of rights or visibility. Is pride a protest? Probably not, but we got to think about that, right? All right. Judy already did a great job with this, but I'm going to leave you with this as a, as a homework exercise to think on your own, or we can talk about it in the Q&A, right? It's the same thing. If I care about climate, I care about my cat. I want to see the cat one, right? I care about mental health. How are you going to conceptualize and operationalize those things? Or there's a ton of data sets out there about mental health. How am I going to go through the data and evaluate which data set is worth starting with or evaluate which set of data, uh, which, which mix of data sets is likely to give me the best outcome? Oh my goodness, I feel like I maybe have been talking for a decade. So summing up, data is not truth, science is not correct. We should always look for these four errors in a data set, random, systematic, validity, and exclusion. And measurement is how we turn the world into data, whether we're doing it ourselves or we're reading or working with a data set that someone else has created or collected. And they've done that, or we do it, through operationalizing, conceptualizing, and validating. And we do that over and over and over again. I'll just leave with one tiny thing is that another problem we have with data is sometimes we feel like we have both too much and not enough of it at the same time. Like I, I have so much data about climate that I'm drowning, but I also don't know what's going on with the climate, right? Like it's, I feel like that's, that's the case with all of these things. And just as a reminder, and this is gonna be preaching to the choir of skeptics, right? We wanna start with questions. What is it that I wanna know about justice? What is it that I wanna know about protests or democracy? That will help me make sense of what data I actually need. Good old fashioned theories and hypotheses. There's a lot of movement towards the end of theory as we think about data science, but we actually really need to start with ideas and then go. And as you've seen through everything we just talked about, subject area expertise is so crucial. There's so much more to being thoughtful and skeptical about data than being good at programming, nothing against programming. All right, so we need thinking people, right? We need instincts to form theories and, and, and think about what might be going on. We need imagination to think about how I could go out and collect a really interesting, meaningful data set about protests or justice or whatever. And we need creativity to design research and we need to be talking to one another and we obviously need these hammers too, eventually. All right, that's it for me. I don't know how long I've been talking. I think it's midnight. Uh, this is my show on March 1st. It's, I'm gonna talk about data for like a second. <laughs> and then I'll talk about, basically it's an overview of sort of the broad field of data science. And it's for people who don't work in data science and are sick of being told, well, it's AI powered without having any idea what that actually means. So I'm gonna give it a try to tell people. That's it, that's what I got. Oh, Daniel, thanks for the, the standing ovation. Like, it's so good. Yes, everybody, please, virtual round of applause for Andrea Jones, Roy. That was amazing. Please take a breath, take a drink of water. I'm going to take a drink of something else. All right. <laughs> Even better. Yeah, um, yeah everybody. It's uh, water for the record, but yeah. Well, uh, that saddens me. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, can you tell that Andrea uh, teaches uh, undergrads? Because um, that was great. Uh, very, very kinetic, very... Um, uh you can tell that um you have to try to capture people's short <laughs> so that was uh yeah this will be going up on youtube everybody i encourage everyone to go back and uh if you missed anything please uh take notes there will be no test on this one uh and share it uh share it with uh anybody who, who you think might need to see it well i was just gonna say i mean i have some problem sets and midterm questions based on <laughs> some of this same material not all but some of it so i'm happy to uh to give a test if you all want to check in in a month or so um if anybody has questions if you could write the word question in all caps in the chat and followed by your actual question we'll get to it uh i'd like to a couple of things that stood out to me were we'll know how successful this talk is uh it, by um if nefarious actors misuse these phrases uh, <laughs> Data is not truth. Science is not correct. Uh, there you go. The admission by a, a, an NYU data scientist. Uh, it's all baloney. Uh, <laughs> it's so dangerous to say these days, but it's like those are, I mean, you all know this, but like that's what makes it so awesome. But it's like if you just get taken out of context and well, science is wrong, you're like, oh shit. I'm sorry, pardon my language. <laughs> this is going to go on. We just flagged this on YouTube. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. All right. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I mean, you're totally right. And what struck me too, as someone who comes from the physical sciences, you know, I did a lot of labs in physics and it's really easy to decide what to measure there. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, you've got inputs for your equations. That's, you know, it's trivial. Of course, you want to measure the force of gravity or whatever. Yeah. But then when you look at the social sciences, it really is an effort in itself, isn't it? Just yeah. to decide what to measure and what that means. 
Yes. And there's people who make, I think, amazing and impressive, but not, not in my view, biased view, recognized enough careers out of survey design and how do you ask people questions to elicit like that bit about are you racist versus do you know anyone who's racist like that's that's decades of work <laughs> to, to then to test it and to get it and to then reevaluate how do you know if you were even right you know that kind of stuff and it's still really really nuanced and thoughtful um you know it, this isn't just for social data i just feel a bit uncomfortable giving examples from like medical data when i don't really know what's going on so but even for you russ you must have is it that obvious what what you're going to measure all the time or how you're going to measure it in well, your work? It, it depends on uh, it depends on how how road it is what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, when yeah. you're, I actually I actually read something about um, string theory and quantum gravity recently, where uh, people have been using old uh, logical techniques to mm. um, more. You know, obviously, we talk about string theory being something that may never be able to be proven, but maybe you can exclude other things through other techniques. And yeah, that's definitely a different way to measure things than the people had been thinking about before. So, right. I mean, I think obviously on the on the higher levels of things, it becomes more of an issue. I think the yeah. Well, what you're saying is reminding me of something. I feel like I'm really just like pushing the New York Times, but they had this article about Pluto and measuring Pluto. Right. And, and it was like, is Pluto a planet? Is it not? And I read it just because I, as an elder millennial, I have a vested interest in Pluto. Uh, but because I feel like I was lied, it doesn't matter. Uh, it turns out it's just a measurement problem, right? Yeah. We go, oh, we found all these other smaller planets. Does that, that rules in all of those if we keep the definition as is. But if we change the definition, that rules out all these things we think are not planets. And by the way, it rules out Pluto. Like that's a measurement yeah. problem, right? And well, I think to mo in that case, it's, it's just a, a problem of language. It's like, what do you mm -hmm. call something? You know, it's uh, okay. I think some of the things they talk about are, at least what they used to talk about is size. Does it sweep out all right. the other things in its orbit? I haven't read the new one yet, so I don't know what they're saying. Right. Now. now they're saying like, what, there's 150 planets because of the new right. one? Right. They're like, well, planets are are interesting because they're places that are like big enough where complex things could start to happen. And if you use that definition, it starts to include just tons and tons of things. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, coming from the geosciences where they would, yeah. name rocks, they would name rocks depending on how much of one particular mineral was in something like that is completely made. You yeah. Know, put, yeah. A, put a name on it. We could have, no. we could have organized it all different ways. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like these are the red ones. These are the blue ones. These are the, so I would do it. I mean, you know, it's where, where does a species begin and end is is a deep question, which is a right? more difficult question than a lot of people realize yeah yeah um i also liked uh you should literally sink it literally sit and think why could this be wrong <laughs> yeah. and i think that's obviously we should all practice that as skeptics and i think the better journalists do think of that or at least the ones who aren't on yeah. incredible time crunches yeah um, in the ridiculous world of journalism at the moment um, I should hasten to add a lot of people are super thoughtful about these things. Um, so, yeah, I see. a lot of people aren't, but a lot of people are. <laughs> a lot of journalists are. I see a question from Daniel building off my comment, apparently. Where in the process does the data science mm. talk with the subject matter expert? Yes, that is a good question. Always, always before, during, after is my answer. In practice, that never happens. I would say at minimum, if you're coming from the, I'm on the kind of method side of things and I'm gonna do something with these numbers, I would say at the very beginning, when you decide like which variables, what data set or data sets to use, is this even a question that's like worth exploring? Like all of that kind of stuff is where I would seek that sort of thing out. So I think, you know, one thing that I love about data science is that any of us who have a computer and some internet can download a data set and start playing around. You can certainly do that and I encourage you to, but if you're gonna actually try to do something that, that improves our understanding of the world, take a moment to talk to someone who's been studying it their whole lives and ideally more than one person. One of the things that happened uh, with social science a lot is that mathematicians and physicists, which is awesome, got super excited about modeling things like standing ovations and whatever else, but they didn't talk to people who under, who study how humans interact. And so a lot of the early models were not that great because they were just like, I'm gonna stand if, it's, if it optimizes over my, you know, the cost of standing versus how much I enjoyed. And it turns out if you talk to a social scientist, they'll be like, you're going to stand if everyone next to you is standing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's very different math. So early on before you start, and another thing that happens with my students is they'll get very excited about a project and they'll say, I'm going to understand whether or not, I'm using the same examples again, whether or not democracy predicts a longer life. 
and I'm going to start thinking, and that's awesome, but that's also something that's been re researched for decades. So save yourself some time. Yes, fresh eyes on a problem for sure, but early on, save yourself some time and be like, is this a thing that, that is, is like a meaningful question? Is this a question that, that others have already tried to answer? How can I make sure that mine is a new way in if I want to keep going and all of that? And then I would say at the very end uh, as well, just to, to, to say like, here's what I think is going on. Like you've been studying elections forever. What do you think, right? So, what I love is, sorry, I'm still talking. <laughs> I'm so, I can't shut up. What I, what I would love is these subject matter experts also feel more comfortable going to data scientists. I think there's a big, I don't know what it is, but like there's a big schism a lot of the time, not for everyone, but my students, for example, either love the data science side of things or are like, I'm coming from ex, uh, 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 education or theater or arts or music. And I like get nervous every time I see an equal sign. And so I would love more data scientists to take the time to read the literature themselves, right? And I would love more people who are subject matter experts to say, well, it's actually not that scary to look at a, an equation if you stop to think about it. Like that's my goal is that we become more of the same people. Yeah, and yeah. true, true, uh, yeah, absolutely. But also, like you said, I mean, just the communication is, is super yeah. important. Uh, you know, again, coming from the sciences, the, you know, the first thing you do is the literature search. You go mm. back and see, has anybody asked this question before, you know? Yeah. Um, well, and the yeah. answer is almost always yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> unless it's just crazy hard. But um, that doesn't necessarily, and I say this to my former grad school self more than anyone, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not valuable for you to answer it because you'll do it in a slightly different way, we hope, right? For sure. But like you said, you don't want to be redoing something else. Yeah. You want to build on that. Not, yes. Uh, not yeah. just you want to stand on the shoulders of giants, not jam yourself in between them, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> to really mess up that. So do question. you have um, do you have people reach out to you, whether it's social scientists or scientists of other kinds saying, I need help wrangling this data? What do I think about it? Yeah. And that's where a lot of my my consulting takes place is on the that people data is that like I want to understand why people are leaving the company or I want to understand why we don't have much diversity or or, you know, I feel like we're we keep hiring people who seem great and they kind of flame out like that kind of stuff tends to be what I do. But I also do some in the context of education. How do you know if a student has learned? Well, we give tests and we can measure whether they're looking at us. Maybe that's some kind of engagement, but we don't know. And so I tend to do more working with subject area experts to say, how would you, person who works with people every single day and sees what's going on in your company, how would you measure success at your company? How would you measure leadership? How would you measure learning, right? And then we kind of craft upwards from there. The other thing that I do is I do training specifically on how people who are data scientists can talk with people who aren't. And my main message is an unpopular one, which is if people don't understand what you're saying, that's your fault. As data scientists, I believe very strongly that our job is to be understood. No, they don't need to know the ins and outs of every model that you're building, and it doesn't have to be a 10-part lecture on you know, unclustered, super whatever, right? But you should be able to communicate what you did, how it happened, and where you got this data, and what the results are to anyone. And I think that's very important. Russ, before we start, we we're talking about science communication. I think that's a, it's a responsibility if you're going to do that kind of work. Doesn't mean you have to spend all your time doing it, but it means yeah. that you have to learn how to do that. Which is, uh, yeah, people didn't think about that decades ago, but mm -mm. Uh, now I think people are realizing that if you don't take some hand in seeing how the public perceives your work, somebody maybe not as scrupulous will do it for you. Right, right. Um, and, and some of the signs, you know, I mean, it's, it, I don't get a little bit conspiracy theory here myself, but like companies, there's something of an arms race, right? Where companies will say, I'm, I'm doing the latest, you know, deep learning neural net to predict what your favorite wine is going to be. And it's like, okay, first of all, you're probably not, you're probably doing regression, right? <laughs> but second of all, we who haven't grown up studying these things or haven't had opportunities or been exposed to these things are just like, I guess it's amazing, right? And I see this play out with consulting clients. I was talking to was a CFO or a C someone O at this company, and they had done these like predictions of people's performance for the upcoming year. And I was like, right, but these predictions are going to be, you know, wrong. And he said, well, how is it going to be wrong? It's data science. And the minute you're saying sentences like that, you're in big trouble, right? Because <laughs> it's definitely for sure. It's informative. It's useful, we hope, but it's definitely wrong. Science is not correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jess has a question. As a history teacher, I'm trying to collect mm. resources or examples of data that can be skewed intentionally or not. Do you have any suggestions? Mm. It can be skewed intentionally or not. Yes. I mean, all, all data ever, uh, but 
Uh, I mean, the the examples that I've done on the political side of things tend to be quite skewed because what we tend to measure or bother measuring is very, very normatively influenced by what we think is important in the political culture in which we live. So I would say go to political data for sure. Uh, and then really any other data that's been <laughs> that's been politicized is you're seeing it happen, right? You're saying, well, deaths through this, these vaccine apps and, and, and this means we're all dying from the vaccines or it means none of us are dying from the vaccines. It's ultimately a debate about, uh, about data quality, right? And so in the climate side of, I mean, all of that are data that's, that it's being skewed or not. I'll try to think of some like hyper-specific cool ones, uh, like an actual data set I can link you to. But my answer for now is almost any data, all the economic data. Go on to the World Bank. And again, it's not, it's not to say it's garbage, but go on to the World Bank and see how the measures of, you know, GDP per capita, purchasing power parity, blah, 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 for every country and go through and look very carefully at how they've measured those things. And it's very different in different places. Cross-national data is very tricky. David has a question. What is the difference yeah. between data science and statistics? Yes, I'm so glad you asked. So statistics, all right. Okay, statistics is a piece of data science and it, it depends it can be a lot of data science. I think you can do data science and spend most of your time in the world of statistics. And I won't say, ah, you're not really doing data science, right? But when I think of data science and someone said earlier on and they were right, it's a very nebulous term, conceptualize, operationalize, right? It goes back to that Venn diagram or three-way Venn diagram that I showed before where it's like statistics is a piece of it and thinking about things like uh, random sampling and sample size and, and whether we want to look at the mean or, or estimate the relationship and thinking about errors and making predictions and statistical models is a big part of it. The computational piece comes in because we're, a, we're able to do those statistical models. There's a lot of things we can do, but we can do it over and over and over and over and over again, as opposed to just statistics where I, you know, run my regression and I have a look at the outcome, right? I could do it a million, million thousand times. So it's, and then that combined with subject area expertise, but you can absolutely be pure statistician and it's hard for me to come up with a good reason to say, well, you're not a data scientist unless maybe you're really working on like the mathematical side of things like proving something um, or, or working with some kind of particular distribution in a very abstract sense. But if you're a statistician and you're working with data, I say call yourself a data scientist. Looks like Benny has a question, but I'm going to go to Craig's first and then we'll go to you, Benny. Are there, okay. Craig, Craig asks, are there any data science games or toys? I'm so excited that you asked that. I don't know. I would love there to be many because I want. Anybody, if anybody knows, if anybody knows, because I would, I'd be interested in that as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton that's happening in the programming, and I really don't mean to diminish programming. It's more me being reactive because everyone just assumes it's all programming. But programming is super valuable, and there are tons of games around that. I mean, this is little kids programming stuff now, but games around data science in particular. I think that's a billion dollar idea. Let's start a, <laughs> found a startup. Everyone, let's do it. I have no idea. Benny, what do you got? And, and, for, and related to my question regarding the, the actual toys, I mean, there, there are websites like Wolfram Alpha, for example. That's true, yeah. That they're not toys, but they're really great places to go to sort of process data for you, which I think is, uh, might, might be, I don't know how many people here are familiar with it. It used to be more popular than it is now. My, my, my question is to do with, I mean, most of what we've been talking about now has to do with how can we learn about reality based on data, right? But there, there are some cases when what the reality is doesn't matter. I mean, Facebook mm. comes to mind here. Mm. Uh, they, they don't really care what the reality of what you want or anything. All they really want to do is what can they do to maximize their income? So how what can we i mean does it matter is it a different type of data science because yeah what you, like, you know what i mean it's yeah a, that's a very good question and it's like it's like you using and this is so biased but like your data science for good or evil like i've been assuming what we're trying to do and this is i guess a big bias on my part that what we're trying to do is better understand the world but in this example that you've given i'm oversimplifying facebook is trying to better understand how to maximize eyes on screen or time where ads are showing or clicks on whatever, right? And there, I mean, I don't know Facebook as well, but one of the things this probably works on Facebook too, that, in, that uh, Instagram is obsessed with is engagement. And so you start to measure engagement. So how interested are your followers in what you're doing, right? And so immediately we're in this operationalization, conceptualization, where it's likes, it's comments, it's shares, it's posts, it's, it's whatever else. 
it's, I don't think they're measuring things you know, wrong. If Facebook says, how long does someone keep scrolling? That's information, but it's what you do with that information. And in my case, if I were to be in charge of Facebook, which thank goodness I'm not, right? I would say, let's try to understand how to minimize time on this site or make sure people are clicking on things that I think are quote, more correct or, or not misinformation or whatever, right? Like that would be my, my goal as a policy. Whereas their goal is keep scrolling, maximize engagement, and that means we're going to drive up, you know, the controversial posts and the this and the that, and all the algorithms are going to go wild. And if you want an example of, of machine learning constantly overcorrecting, like go to TikTok and look at a video for a half second longer than another video, and you'll get nothing but videos like that after that, because they're just trying to keep you on. So it's less about the data and more about what they're, what they're doing with it and what they're trying to optimize over, maximize over, or whatever, I think. But I'm curious, because in your world, you're dealing with this kind of data all the time, right? Where it's like ad blockers versus ad blocker blockers. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I work on, ad, internet ads. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times ads, I, when I, every now and again, I'll talk to marketing people. I don't know much about marketing, but uh, I'll talk to marketing people because they're marketing experts who come in and say, well, what are my measures out there for whether an ad is working? And it's like, click through to look at the site or there's like click through and then buy the thing, right? And that's fine. And I get why you're doing that. Sometimes people get creepy and say, how long did you look at the ad or was the cursor over? Like you can get weird, right? But what if there were way more interesting ways to measure or not whether an ad works, right? What about the person who sees the ad and then doesn't actually buy the thing, but tells a friend about it or something, right? How do you pick that up? I don't know. And so I think a little bit more imagination and that's where the expertise from people in marketing, I can't even fathom what it would be because I don't know anything about marketing, right? That kind of thoughtfulness could help us come up with much more interesting ways to measure whether an ad worked than if someone clicked on it, right? One thing I saw at a journalist, a data journalism conference about headlines. At 538, writing headlines was a huge part of the article. And I, you published articles we were talking before this, right? The art, getting the, art, the, the title right is, is everything. And so, and then you measure, we would measure success on terms of how many clicks on the article. What's the most read on this website? What's the most shared? What's the most emailed? What's the most whatever, right? Most commented on. And, and someone came up and he said, when I see that this article was the most commented on, I don't conclude that this journalism was the best. I conclude that this was the best headline we wrote. Right. And so you're not measuring how good the article is, but you think that you might be. Anyway, that's a, what, again, what do you do with that information? So everything on the internet is designed to keep us staring at it. Uh, so now I'm just getting angry. <laughs> um, we got one more question. Yes. Yeah. But before then, uh, I want to put, I just put in the chat again uh, a link to our donate page for everybody. Um, if you like what we do here, we are a nonprofit. Uh, so we do rely on the donations of nice people like yourselves to keep these kinds of things going. Uh, and then below that is our YouTube. This will be going up on YouTube at a later date. Uh, hope, we hope sooner rather than later. Uh, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube if you haven't. We don't put junk on there. We don't put little 20 second clips. Everything's gonna be a good meaty thing like this. Uh, and also um, one other thing that kind of relates to what you were saying. Uh, I do a thing myself uh, called uh, AIPT Science. I just put that link up where I try to um, Talk about skeptical things like this in uh, the um, veneer of pop culture. We've got a big month coming up. We're going to try to post something every day. If anybody has any data science games or <laughs> uh, toys that they know of, that would be great for that. Oh, and we got to invent those. Percent right. I mean, we. Um, I get into the weeds with the uh, the editors and the owners there a little bit. Uh, it's a bigger site. They do comics and movies and everything, and I have my own little uh, vanity corner for this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, you're 100% right. It really is about the headline because we'll see things shared to like news apps and things like that and things that will just rocket up in views for really no reason. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it really is just about how much uh, it catches, people, uh, catches people's eyes and they click on it. And uh, you know what? That's a little disheartening, but also um, when you're in the business of trying to get mm -hmm. good information in front of people who might not see it otherwise, it's a good trick to, to keep yeah. in the back pocket. I'm going to start starting all my articles with, you wouldn't believe what, and then no. uh, just keep going. <laughs> I mean, New you point. might think clickbait is dirty, but- uh, That's how you do it. It is the way of the world. Yep. Uh, Eric, how best can you visually portray how one data set mm. is more valid? Yes. So step one, don't use those horrible pie donut charts like I did. Uh, 
Uh, but I blame Forbes for that. I take no responsibility. All right, good for me. Uh, but two, plotting data is an amazing way to portray how good or bad or sketchy is, I think, the great word for it, right? So if you're working with a, something that's like a scatter plot or a whatever, and, and you have little dots for every observation, bar charts can be kind of tough, right? Because you're not really, but you get a sense of the sample size in the scatter plot if you're working with discrete data, right? Um, putting all the data, you know, or one of the particular variables from one data set, you know, these are all the democracies and then doing the same for the other one and saying either it's, there's way fewer or we're missing everything that's super up high. Or if you actually look at who's in here, there's no overlap with what I think is making sense. I mean, it depends on what's actually wrong, but wherever you can layer the, uh, the data sets over one another, the better. Like I, I don't like, I, I like simple visualizations where we can, but the, you know, put, if you say, how happy has the world gotten over time? Do it through the three, you know, three or four or five different uh, data sets that you've used. You might make the one that you think is the best, uh, darker or something like that, and then either annotate or find some way to show whether like through, through sample size or through something in terms of why you think the other one is not as good or whatever. But it's, it's uh, such a good question. I'm not a visualization expert myself, but that's its own area of like art and science and communication and design and, and it's a, it's a beautiful area uh, of work that I think needs more work. And I would love to see more work that talks about the data itself. We tend to, to zoom in on like trends and networks and flashy stuff. But, you know, even, even the protest example that I gave before, like I would love to see the option to toggle on like this version of measuring protests versus this version and then be able to see them all and be able to see one or two and then have some other reason why you think it's, it's not as good or, le or, or better or whatever. Um, Oh. Mitch, the answer is I don't know, but it's a great idea. <laughs> Mitch has a comment here that yeah. has facts. Uh, it's only click ah. content doesn't match up with the headline. There's nothing wrong with having an attractive headline. Just make sure the content you're providing matches what's expected. Thank a you, plus. Mitch. One hundred percent. See, we're measuring clickbait better already. Yes. <laughs> Peter had a question, uh, genetic algorithm. How does that fit into data science? Yes, are you, uh, I, love, I love to hear about a genetic algorithm. Uh, I don't know if you're a John Holland fan, if that's where that's coming from, awesome. Uh, it does fit in to data science as a simulation tool. It's typically less about like, let's explain why some empirical thing happened. And it can be used more to say what might a, quote, very specifically defined optimal version of this look like, or what might be an ideal strategy uh, for something like that. Basically, the idea of a genetic algorithm is you have a bunch of algorithms that, that compete with one another to, to succeed. And it's up to us as researchers to define what we mean by succeed. But it's, it's a very interesting way to think about how to actually evolve the algorithms themselves to do things with data. So I see them less in the form of, I mean, you said simulation yourself. I see them much more in the form of like abstract modeling. So something like, generally, I think these are the top five inputs I need to care about to measure the spread of Omicron. And now I'm going to think about what, what are some ways to evolve an algorithm that would do a really good job and think about what I mean by really good job, right? As opposed to trying to simulate in the sense of like, here's all the data on the stock market. What's the stock market going to do tomorrow? I see it more in modeling than simulation, but that's maybe not even a distinction that matters that much. All right. Um, if anybody has a quick question uh, for Andrea, that'd be great. Uh, otherwise, please, another round of applause in your head or uh, in <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Andrea, for being here with us. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to talk with you all. Thank you all for your thoughtfulness and questions sure. and for your time.